So I want to share three observations. First, the threat of devastating regional epidemics and like Ebola and global pandemics like the 1980s, uh, 1918 flu is real and growing. We've got a web of risk factors, population growth, urbanization, travel, uh, conflict. We, we, the, the latest Ebola outbreak in, in the Congo was slowed up by conflict and uh, climate change. Uh, the, the food industry. So, so we, we're in a web of risk factors. We've already seen a, a fourfold increase over the last decades in outbreaks. 60% of them are, are yet of origin. <clears throat> and um, if you ask the question, what could, could kill millions and devastate economies in a matter of weeks or months, the answer falls into four categories. The first is influenza which unfortunately most of us think of as a bad cold. But it's, it's to your question, it's a nightmare for, uh, for epidemiologists at all. Uh, the 1918 flu, which, which infected a third of the people coming out of World War II, uh, killed 50 to 100 million people and uh, devastated the economy. Four times as many people in half as much time as the war. It was in Australia, you had 40% of Australia that suffered. And um, in New South Wales, 50% uh, of the deaths were in the 20 to 40 range, which was like it happened worldwide. The pandemic flus are not for children and, and old people and the sick. They, they hit everybody. So the, the economic cost, uh, the cost to, to business, businesses these days and, 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 and government also and the military thinks about one system like cyber threats, one location, like uh, uh, an area that's subject to tsunami, or, or one location, like active shooter. But a pandemic is the only thing that can hit sources, your supply sources, your staff, your, 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 your uh, customers, everywhere and be there over a couple of year period. So it's a real threat. The, um, the second, second category is viruses of uh, pandemic potential, like the SARS virus, uh, the severe acute respiratory syndrome that came out of China. Um, and there's, a, there's a handful of viruses that have pandemic potential for which we don't have the, the, um, the weapons of defense. The third category, which WHO added in March, sounds like something from Madison Avenue, Disease X. It's not. Disease X is their term for things that, um, that we don't know about today, but that, that could, could get us. If you think about it, Ebola in 1976, when it was first discovered, was the disease X. They didn't know what it was. AIDS, which we now know came out of, of, of uh, Southeast Cameroon in 1920 and slowly worked its way into the world. But when it appeared in 1981, it was totally new. It was the disease X of, of 1981 and the first new pandemic in human history. SARS, which came out of China in 2003, was the first new uh, pandemic, sorry, AIDS was the first new pandemic in modern times. SARS was the first new pandemic of the century. And the final risk is bioterror. Um, and just as two examples, uh, or bioterror, bioerror. Um, Korea, North Korea, their labs have a dozen other pandemic pathogens, um, and, uh, including smallpox and anthrax. They haven't weaponized them yet as far as is actually the South uh, Korean defense is more consistent. So that's, no, that's point number one. The risks are really <coughs> growing, and um, no island is an island when it comes to epidemics. You were really lucky with, with, with MERS. The second observation is that scientists and public health people know what to do and know what needs to be done. Um, and we finally have a tool to measure uh, preparedness, which the World Health Organization has developed. The, the, the guiding rules on, on uh, infectious diseases come under something called the International Health Regulation, which uh, IHR. I'm only I'm going to try to avoid acronyms. One you need to know is IHR, International Health Regulations. It's the only tool the World Health Organization has that has the force of international law. Finally, after. 20 years after the alarm was raised that we need stronger international health regulations, 
we finally now have a tool, something called the Joint External Evaluation. It's a tool that lets countries assess with outside support their readiness to prevent, detect, and respond. How do you think the world is doing? If you look around, if you were to imagine, imagine a, a map, you, that you've got some green places like North America and Europe and, and Australia, uh, but then you've got, if you look at Africa, uh, where they've done a lot of assessments, they're mostly red and yellow. If you look in your neighborhood, there's Southeast Asia, which, which by these assessments uh, is mostly yellow, so they're, they're, they really don't have that capacity. And then you've got two big question marks, India and China, who haven't done it yet. And we know with some of the, the, the worst of the viruses that, that China's not ready. So uh, that China, sorry, with the worst of the viruses, they're not sharing the information. Um, they're, they're not really transparent about it. And in, indeed, as, as Ambassador Peter would say, um, the influenza, which is basically the most troublesome virus because it travels in packs. It's three or four different flu viruses together. It's constantly mutating, and it's between basically chickens, pigs, humans, and waterfowl who are the transcontinental uh, transporters. And, and that's a real, that's a really uh, shaky situation. But a lot of a lot of the worst of the flu viruses do come out of China. We don't have a, a good uh, grip on that. So. Uh, Another key part of, of the, this joint external evaluation is it brings the partners together, the different parts of government, and so the veterinary folks are there, the animal health <coughs> folks are there, and so we do have some tools to figure out how, how safe we are. So, so second point is that, um, first point, the risks are real and growing. Second point, we know what to do. The third point is that, um, as always when it comes to infectious diseases, we're just not moving fast enough with enough resources and enough shared purpose. A lot's happened, but we have this cycle of panic and complacency. After SARS, which scared the heck out of the business people, I know some people in Australia are getting tired of hearing about SARS in Asia, but it's a really telling case. Travel to China plummeted, it was half. The business community, there were thousands of, of, of jobs lost, and uh, uh, and, and literally thousands of paper, pages of papers generated. But if you look a few years later, not much had happened. And some things, but, but in many countries, there hadn't been much response. So there's this cycle of panic and, and, then, and then neglect. With nuclear threats, it's been 70 years ago, but we still really stay vigilant on nuclear threats. With military threats, um, which which wars and conflict kill many fewer people in infectious diseases, but somehow that's on our on our uh, on our mind. But epidemics, it's out of sight, out of mind. And a couple of examples of of how we we get into denial and and, and complacency. By 1950, the world had a eradicated small, I'm oh, sorry, by 1950, Europe and North America had eradicated smallpox. By 1950, a horrific disease that killed a half a million people in the last century, uh, that killed a third of the people who were infected and blinded or, or disformed the rest. So in 1951, the head of the World Health Organization said, let's do for the rest of the world what we've already done for Europe and North America. You know how long it took for the world's health leaders to make the decision to do that? It took three World Health Assemblies in 15 years. It was only in 1966. You know how many people died while, while the leaders were talking? 20, uh, 30 to 40 million people. And we saw the same thing in the early parts of AIDS, where, where countries like the US, we politicized it, had gotten into ideology. And we delayed the response by five hundred for, for ten years. Australia, even though it had a conservative government then, you took a good public health approach and got off to a good start. So um, the last chapter is, is ring the alarm and rouse the leaders. And um, we know we know that um, uh, that there's a tendency for governments to hide and hold back on, on 
talking about ever coming. We saw that with the plague in India, and it's typically at the top level, it's the trade people saying you're gonna mess up trade, and the agriculture people saying, oh, they need their meat, and everything else. But that sort of delay is, is really deadly. So we need to rouse the leaders um, with, with uh, some of the things we can talk about in, in the beginning of the conversation. But it, it, it is not enough for the professional community to know what needs to be done. It's not enough to educate political leaders because they're subject to the economics and the politics of that. And if the voting public isn't behind them, then, then it's much harder to keep them on board. So it really has to be an informed public, which is why we wrote the book for the leaders, uh, informed professionals and informed permitted leaders. Um, so a long answer to a short question, but, but that's, that's the sort of um, you know, big threat uh, we know what to do, but how do we pass that? Well, well, thanks, Jonathan. Um, what I propose to do now, I'll ask each of the panelists a, 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 an unscripted, probing question. Um, uh, and after that, um, I'll open the floor to, to questions. But uh, I want to start off with, with Alison, because one thing taken on this job was all of a sudden I'm, 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 I'm confronted with animal health issues, which is very new to me. Um, a lot of work in human health, but um, dealing with animal health is a whole new, whole new caper for me. And it's quite interesting because what drives animal health are, are different, are different drivers to human health. They're economic, it's trade, it's it's, it's income, um, it's it's the, it's the it's the money side of the shop, and so that drives a lot of the, the investments and the, and the focus of animal health. And I just want to ask Alison, um, given the role of zoonotic influenzas in, in, in health security. Your observations of the state of the animal health systems in our immediate region, and particularly anything um, which you consider to be of particular note, and also how that relates back to Australia's animal health systems. Sure, thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the invitation. Um, you talked about drivers being trade, which is important. It is um, a, a key driver for us. Australia does hold a very favourable disease status in the world and we do preserve that and work very hard to protect that. But one of the other drivers is of course um, our human colleagues, so the whole One Health approach in terms of yes we look after the animals but we don't lose sight of you guys either. So we're, we're always thinking about it. So in terms of the what's happening in the region, of course we're interested in what's happening in the region and the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources in particular so that the federal uh, agency do a lot of offshore work. They do a lot of offshore capacity building, capability building, etc. cetera. Um, from a perspective from me looking at a jurisdictional herd, so my peeps, is around what is going on there and what is coming at us over the horizon. So of interest to us at the moment, um, and although it's not one of the pandemics you mentioned, it's a, it's a it's a peak pandemic, is African um, swine fever, which is moving very quickly through um, Europe. It's also moving through Asia, so we're watching that very carefully. But what it does show is that we need to be vigilant about uh, entry pathways into Australia that may, of course, show us or shine a light on other entry pathways that can point to uh, diseases that your particular uh, human colleagues are particularly interested in. Of course, avian influenza is something that we're always monitoring. Uh, the, the bird flight paths come right past um, my backyard. Uh, and so we do actually have a whole national program around surveillance in wild birds, looking for AI, looking for what is out there, um, monitoring to see if there is any potential um, low pathogenic type that we're looking at that has potential for us. So we do have those early warning systems in place and we also are doing that monitoring through the Department of Ag and Water Resources offshore and very, very active about that. You spoke about um, one of the other ones that we, we're interested in and we monitor particularly is uh, Nipah virus. Um, but we're interested in that from uh, the Hennepa virus family with particularly Henry. You mentioned that in the, the um, introduction, but that's about understanding how these uh, viruses move through <coughs> that population, but also, again, pathways of entries into um, areas that we're responsible for. And the other one I wanted to touch on was around arboviruses. So, um, in particular, what the one that we're interested in is blue tongue virus. And so, we do actually have offshore sentinel herds 
uh, where we are monitoring animals. We, as in Australia, we also have a significant national arbovirus monitoring program where there is a, a whole structured surveillance program through Sentinel Herds monitoring for blue tongue. We're also looking at other arboviruses of interest. But where our worlds collide and connect is if the, uh, uh, the, um, the vectors of interest to us for our um, arboviruses are moving, it's likely that they're, they're also moving in the areas you're interested in, such as dengue fever. So look, we are very interested in what's happening for our neighbours and with our neighbours. We work closely with them, as I said. We're interested at um, a couple of levels. One is around exotics, so something that we don't have here. Um, and so we're intending for it not to get here. We're also very inter interested in emerging, and perhaps you could put um, um, need put into that maybe. But then the other one that we're interested in our neighbours is re-emergence. So um, perhaps diseases we've had here, we've successfully eradicated or that they're at such a low prevalence, but they may be re-emerging um, and maybe look a little bit different. So we have an interest in that. I just want to make the comment around the, um, um, you talked about disease X, I guess one of disease X for us, even though it wasn't perhaps in the same category as you, was, was hendrovirus uh, in horses in 1994, where we had horses dying. Um, it, no one knew what it was. Well, we actually thought it was maybe African horse sickness or something exotic like that. And it did take quite a while to identify it and understand it. So we, we have our disease Xs as well. And then you, the other comment, if I may, because I'm here for the animals, is you talked about the, the JEE evaluation. and. It was a great um, joint effort and truly One Health United approach in terms of the report that came in. But I'm obliged to mention um, PBS, which is Performance of Veterinary Services, which is um, a performance measurement tool for preparedness of um, our members' veterinary services. So that is a tool that is used by the OIE worldwide. And in fact, Australia as um, a country put itself forward for PBS evaluation in 2015. Um, and we have published that, it is available. We have put it out there for all our trade partners to take a look at. So when you come to saying rouse the leaders, we were roused in, in Australia. And in fact, we've now taken that to another level, which is that each jurisdiction has now undertaken its own PBS evaluation so that we get a, a probably deeper look um, within the Australian veterinary um, performance and the veterinary services. So uh, watch this space around that. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a nice little segue because you mentioned the international health regulation, the joint external evaluation. And, uh, you know, my my very limited exposure has just shown me just how important both the international regulations are and having a common framework for each country to look at how well prepared they are to detect, respond, and uh, plan and manage for a disease outbreak. You know, in a common language across different countries. You mentioned the animal health one, but of course the, the, the large part of it's around human health. And Australia had its own joint external evaluation of our, our preparedness against the international health regulation. I wouldn't mind asking Sharon if she could just reflect on what the findings of those, um, what that external evaluation of Australia is and what, and what we're doing about it. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Peter. And um, thanks very much for that unscripted and probing question. Um, in the event that you might ask, <laughs> I'm happy to report the, um, the, the remission report with me. And um, look, what I can say about the JE, it was, uh, it was a really, really phenomenal exercise for us. And there's a couple of members of my team sitting in the room who were intimately involved in that. This was a, a year-long preparation. Um, we actually stuck our hand up to do this. So 82 countries have done JEs. Um, we didn't have to be in any particular order in the, in the queue, um, but we thought it was a pretty good idea, particularly in terms of, um, of really just checking against our own self-assessment, so the kind of delusion you put <coughs> through every year that everything's perfect. So it's actually really good. We really welcomed um, you know, the opportunity to engage with external experts. Um, you still have to do a self-assessment though as part of the JEE exercise and that probably took six or seven months in its own right because um, in this country of course we have six states, two territories in the Commonwealth, nine jurisdictions <coughs> and um, but we decided to make a virtue of that um, in relation to being able to convince the, the mission team that even in a federated country like Australia um, you can get national coordination right and you can have a very well functioning health system. 
Now, of course, the fact is in Australia, we do have a very well functioning health system. We're really fortunate in that respect. Um, but the, the Office of Health Protection, um, which I manage, my division, is actually relatively new. We're only about 12 years old, um, <coughs> formed in 2006, and I think have come an enormous way in that time. Um, the states and territories under our constitution, as you know, are responsible for health service delivery in Australia. So the role of the Commonwealth is mainly in relation to national coordination and in making sure that, um, that we've got all of the systems in place to kick into action should an emergency or a crisis um, take place. We, and that would usually mean something affecting um, more than one jurisdiction and that required um, a, a sort of a major resource input and national coordination. So our, and our Chief Medical Officer, Professor Brendan Murphy, has a really critical role in that as the Chair of the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. So this governance of the way we, we do health protection prevention in Australia was a really important, um, I guess, ingredient as to why we ended up doing so well in the JE. And, and we did do very well. And in fact, I think and it's not about scores. It's all about what you learn along the way. Um, and it's all about what we're going to do next. But I think we might be among the top two scoring nations of, of anyone who's done the JE. So we're pretty pleased about that. Um, what we learned, Jono touched on a couple of, you know, a lot of really important points, um, especially that, you know, protecting human health is not just the responsibility of the health sector. That is an absolutely critical one. So this business of whole of government coordination, that is the life we live. And um, working with our colleagues in agriculture, working with our colleagues in foreign affairs, working with the Australian intelligence community, working with home affairs and particularly emergency management Australia. Um, I think I said DFAT, I'll say it again. Um, but basically um, it's really important that, the, um, that those um, linkages and coordination works well so that we can get the best outcomes that we need. Um, so can I just try and Peter and Cody have to jump in to do that? So DFAT was very pleased that Australia volunteered because we happen to be co-chairing the International um, what's it called Council for JEs. Um, oh, JE Alliance. JE Alliance, which was encouraging that across the world. So it was good that we volunteered yeah. and we were encouraging others to do it. We've talked about the JEW as if they're a kind of a given. Mm. There was an active debate within the WHO cycles around the fact that whether the EVs would have been encouraged, should this be mandated, it's still going. Yes. It's, yeah. You'd think it makes sense, but actually there were yeah. still many parts of that wonderful alliance called the WHO yeah. that were actively against it and trying to out. So. And, it, and it all gets down to, like you said, Blair, the politics of it and where people thought <coughs> the JE was coming from. Is it in some way impugning sovereignty of nations? You know, um, some uh, nations are very supportive of multilateralism, others aren't. And so and, uh, effectively I see that uh, as a, a lot. Um, to do with what was behind some of those objections. As far as Australia goes though, and you know better than me being from DFAT, we want to be um, a really good uh, corporate citizen in the international community. And as I mentioned before, we certainly want to show regional leadership. Um, so while, so we use the JE as that opportunity, as well as I said before, um, getting some external experts in, because frankly, their observations about what, um, not only what we're good at, but what we're not so good at, help us in the case that we have to make to government. And that is a, a really critical point in relation to John, I was talking about rousing the leaders. And, um, and we really just thought that whatever comes out of the JE, which is going to help us develop a national action plan for health security, which is a five year action plan, is a bit of a roadmap for us. And it helps us to make the policy case. It helps us to get resources. It gives us the evidence and the proof that we need um, to, to look at those gaps. And, um, and they were not absolutely huge gaps, but there were some significant ones. One Health Surveillance is an absolutely classic one. Uh, we do a human disease surveillance not too badly. We've got a nationally notifiable disease surveillance system. Technology a little bit old. You know, we're thinking that we, we can do better there and we've got our head in that space. Um, and um, But what we really don't do that well in a surveillance sense is coordinate seamlessly with the animal sector. That's obviously really critical in relation to human disease, communicable disease. It's also very, it's critical in relation to antimicrobial resistance um, because there is obviously flows of resistant organisms between humans and animals 
as well as um, obviously uh, in between human settings. And we have, uh, we do consider AMR to be, you know, a, a potential absolute crisis if we get that wrong. And that is as a planet, Australians are high prescribers or in primary care of antibiotics. Uh, we need to get much better at stewardship and we need, get, which is preserving our antibiotics, using them properly. Um, and we're also very interested in research and development. So um, what the, um, uh, the JE did tell us, um, Peter, was uh, about a lot of things that uh, it thinks that we're doing well. The laboratory capacity and the biosecurity arrangements were a, a particular strength um, of us in Australia. And it's exactly like Alison said, being the island nation we are, Australia's um, kind of pretty good when it comes to biosecurity, but we can't be complacent. And we've got um, a very good Biosecurity Act, which is fairly recent, 2015, which has replaced the old Quarantine Act, which was 1901. And through that, we've got some excellent mechanisms and um, um, legislative underpinnings uh, for what for what we need to ensure that listed human diseases, and there are seven of them, and human influenza or pandemic potential is one, um, that we keep that out of the country. So it gives us a very good basis. Can I make just one point mm -hmm. on that, which has been fabulous. What, what you just heard uh, from Sharon about the conversation and interactions that happened in Australia, which already was in a good, good shape, that's exactly the kind of conversation that's happened in countries like Uganda and Ethiopia and Peru and other places that have done this. And so that's the critical thing is that they've got, that it, you're not, you haven't been the source, other than Andrew, which is with animals, you haven't been the source of, but the countries that we need to worry about um, are, are, are the sources. And they're having this conversation, and that's the power of something like the International Health Regulations. And the, the, the JEE. It's one of those potentially boring but important things. Is it is such a tool for the interactions and the awareness, and then the, the support from from countries like Australia to actually get up to green. On, on well, thank you, Sharon and Joe. I just want to just turn quickly to, to Blair. I want to leave a little bit of time for for questions from the floor. But um, obviously, in two thousand and fourteen, we had the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Um, and we mobilised a, a whole lot of government response to that. Really good to get your reflections on on what that, what how that was made up and how effective you thought it was and lessons learned. Mm -hmm. So, like John just said, I what kind of recalls to me was well, there are elements that were boring, good, methodical, practical coordination stuff, and then there was other bits that were slightly edge of the seat, airy, make it up as you go along. Uh, we got it right, mostly, um, but we definitely had both those elements. So Karen's, um, Sharon's predecessor um, and myself co-chaired, and actually we did a review, and this might surprise some of you, surprised me at the time, we did a review post it, and I said it was one of the few examples where there was co-leadership across the Australian public service on a major crisis response. So DFAT and Department Health co-led the response, the board bit was we met kind of every second day, we were on the phone every, every week, we felt like, 20 minutes, coordinated response, make, trying to make sure our domestic and our international policy, both policy response and then our practical response were actually joined up. There was a couple of lessons out, out of that, I think from we, when we did a review of that exercise domestically. One was we, unsurprisingly, didn't do enough on the comms. Um, there was a late interest, and as we know from that 2014 outbreak, there was lots of signs early on that the world, including Australia, didn't really pay enough attention to. Um, but then when there was an interest, it was just this massive out of control interest from the media um, and trying to give um, good advice to our government, good advice to the media about what it was, where, where it can, can go. There were two examples I recall to give you a sense of focus. So one was we had a cruise ship doing laps for probably about a day and a half in the Pacific when there were reports of a possible Ebola outbreak. I won't say which cruise ship um, was doing that. Another one we also had, I think, reports of Ebola symptoms in, I forget now, it was Tonga or Samoa. It's probably a good thing I hear which country, uh, with a person who showed up in hospital with all the symptoms. Uh, when we asked that person where they come from, they come from West Africa, or part of a group of 40 or 50 people that had been to a religious conference. They'd made all the way back through parts of Australia <coughs> and all the way through Australia and got to kind of the health system in the city. So that, so that was my kind of deep edge of the seat moment. You know, what don't we know, where they come from, why haven't our systems picked them up? Um, so just to give two things on the policy and practical, Australia was actually co-chairing the Security Council at that time, 
some of you may remember certain motions that were passed on the floor that we, we were leading. So we're trying to manage our domestic response with the, the, the um, uh, Security Council resolution that was not was calling for the free move of people and no restrictions, and try and manage that with lots of domestic pressure around moving the people from West Africa, and that was some, some, some of the hairy moments, um, trying try to get that right. Um, the practical staff working through Australia's role, managing our resources in the case that the bulb did make Australia, um, our leadership role in the region, so we actually did quite a bit of work thinking about possible scenarios that may happen across the Pacific, um, and making sure we had resources to manage for that, and then working through how best the Australia respond to support what was going on in West Africa. Lots of calls for a range of responses, there were actually a range of choices that Australian government could have made. In the end, we went for a firm for Aspen um, that, that was um, pr pr provided a great service. But we did have to work our way through each of those kind of policy questions, policy choices about how how do we look after Australia's interests, the region's interests, what's our responsibility as part of, part of the global joint joint up. Um, working through that, we then had some really practical things. If we are asking people to go and work in West Africa, and many other countries, many other organisations had to work their way through these practical questions as well. What are our obligations looking after our staff and people that are working in countries where there's an outbreak and there's a reasonably good chance they may um, get sick and they may even die? Then you get the really tricky question of treating internationals versus treating locals and how do you get that right? So again, had to work our way through a range of other things. Lots of media playing out through all of this. So we had countries offering to host and treat people publicly and then privately saying, no way. Um, that was hard to handle. <coughs> you can't name those countries. And we were getting criticized for not moving quicker and not doing things. But some countries had said they would do it. Actually, privately, they'd said other things, refusing to let people planes land, all those sorts of questions. Limited supply of resources. So if you were going to. Um, the, the um, kind of um, and experts other than me will know the, um, the rates of progression or regression for people who, who are sick and the amount of time they can be in plane and where they can be and where they have to land and various things like that. There was a limited number of planes with the right pods, with the right equipment, um, and there was a long waiting list. So people were trying to contract those planes to get them um, uh, to look after their people and quickly. So I think we moved to good places, which was more capability and capacity on the ground, but obviously that came at a time when actually the, the infection rates were full, so there was probably more capacity. So in some ways we didn't really have to face that issue uh, right up front. We had to work in a kind of coordinated space, so worked and did okay, I think, I think the global community did okay um, late, so I have to acknowledge it was late, but by the time it got there it was more coordinated, we worked very close with the UK. Um, and we embedded part of our team in their team, so we were part of the decision-making process about where Aspen went, how they served, um, and then how patients were, were referred and tracked. So yeah, there, there was a mixture of sort of good policy stuff. The, um, John Owen and Sharon um, have talked a bit about the lessons. So JWEs came out of that, WHO reforms have come out of that. Um, <coughs> Uh, I actually agree with John's comment around funding cycles, and that was part of our framing for why we, the um, Health Security Centre Australia has been through, was going through, to look back at our, at our funding. We had quite a lot of funding uh, through through the avian flu and SARS outbreaks, and that had a 10 year cycle that was falling off again. Um, I think the centre did quite a bit of work to map out global funding and actually re regional funding, and there was that was tapering off and falling off. I went to Cambodia last year. And that was pretty much 10 years after the Adrian and SARS, and they were FAO, um, WHO were all suddenly run out of funding. So that was an active policy choice for us to actually, we need to reinvest in this, we need to think about how we're going to support this on the way through. Um, and I do think the WHO reforms that have come out of sort of the, um, the Ebola in particular have improved, not perfect, but they certainly have led to a better response. And we've seen some of those. So I'll stop there. Thank Thanks, Lee. I was going to ask Joe a question, but given the time, I might set to the floor, and I think you'll get the question anyway through the floor. But in another unscripted move, I'd like to ask Lisa to ask the first question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess my question would go to, and this, it, this is being alluded to a little bit by some of the panellists, um, the challenge between the national security interests and the need of actually sharing information with, with, with the public. Um, this idea that, it, that there's, I guess, a certain point where it, where it becomes a challenge between these, these competing interests, you know. How do you maintain that accountability as a, 
as a government to the people of sharing information about a potential pandemic or something that's happening um, versus the fact that obviously doing so creates a huge security risk at the same time. How are those factors weighed out? Okay. Um, I might just start on that. And um, there's something um, uh, that I was involved in and my colleague Rhonda and, and some of my other staff in the room was the um, Zika virus outbreak. And, um, and we learned a lot about what to do in the Zika virus outbreak, even though it was something that was happening in South America and it seemed like a long way away and it was mozzies that we don't have in this country and all of those kind of things. But what we did know is that the public were very, very interested in it. And it was all out there in social media and everyone was talking about it and we had no choice whatsoever in relation to burying our head in the sand, so we didn't. So we really got on the front foot with that one and the Chief Medical Officer at the time, Professor Chris Bagley, uh, we made sure we convened interdepartmental committees, we briefed the Australian Government Crisis Committee um, and we also made sure that we put plenty of information out there to the public and to health professionals in relation to what might happen if we do get cases of imported Zika as it turned out. So, so I think the issue was, and it's not a um, so we're not talking about pandemic influenza, absolutely, um, but we are talking about an outbreak that worried people and all I can say is if it's at all possible, communicate early and often and say whatever you can. So we definitely, there was definitely a hangover of interest from Ebola through to the Zika. So there's no question there was a, I would say still a heightened level of interest that, that exists in, in media and, and the broader minds of Australia for, for this issue. But in terms of weighing up some of that reassurance, you know, airport scanners, I'm sure many, many of you know the kind of accuracy of airport scanners. I'm sure they're good. not. <laughs> public reassurance. So there were some things that were very deliberately being done in, in, in a way to send a signal um, uh, that, that was assuring the public yeah. that we're onto it. Then there was lots of social media stuff and things that we could come to. Yeah, thank you very much for all of those comments. Um, I guess uh, I wanted to ask a question about what's not working. I wanted to ask a question about what's not working. And I recognize that JWE uh, had very good results for Australia. But, and also the great work that was done during the Ebola crisis. But I'm thinking back to uh, H5N1, that crisis, when at least at that point when it looked like this virus was going to there was a risk that it was going to begin transmitting human to human easily. It was killing over 50% of the people who had, I think, at least at the time, it was 70% of those. Those are the ones that reported to clinics. Um, China was not sharing the, uh, the data on how the virus was changing. Um, in Cambodia, I remember there were handful of public health officials that were managing what was going on in the country and a couple of WHO people on the ground. Um, I remember seeing a simulation uh, in Australia showing one person carrying this theoretically high, uh, easily transmitted virus landing in Sydney or Quantum in the Vietnam, Vietnam Air Flight and the red dot spread within a couple of months across all of Australia. Um, and um, there was the challenge in any case in those days of sequencing a virus, uh, a vaccine, producing a vaccine would take months and months and months, and then even more complexity around distributing the vaccine. And I remember even when the fear of this outbreak was prevalent, people were hoarding Tamiflu. And it was impossible to get time to in wealthy countries, let alone in less developed countries. So yeah, I guess my question is, what's changed in that picture with a potential pandemic uh, that is that is has that case fatality rate that is enormous and really unprecedented? Because even Spanish flu was affected the most. Uh, you know, economically productive people in society, but the case mortality rate was a lot lower than 50% for those places. So what's changed, because I get the feeling it's a slightly rosy picture, at least with respect to, um, you know, a, a highly uh, contagious and uh, deadly pandemic. Well, one thing that hasn't changed is, is the perspective that a lot of people in leadership take. take. There's this amnesia about it. 
China paid dearly for, for trying to hide SARS. They didn't gain at all. And that's a, the, the history says that it's an illusion to think that, that their security history, that you benefit security by, by hiding epidemics. You make everything worse. That's what history tells us. We can go through the examples. So I think part of it is just keeping at, uh, I mean, China's <coughs> withholding information right now on, on some of the, the viruses. Uh, but in the end, it, it's going to hurt them more. And I think keeping, keeping that message and that pressure at, at all levels and, and just coming, coming back to the history of the consequences and unpicking the illusion that, that secrecy, secrecy actually protects you. you. I mean, the viruses aren't listening. They don't know that, that, they're, that they're supposed to be they're kept secret. Uh, and, I, and I think that's on all of us to do. It sounds like that's the kind of dynamic Blair was, was was pursuing with the security guards. So, so I think Sharon talked about a, a, an easier example of that national security dilemma, or, um, and the perceived possible impact of not sharing information to protect economic act activity and movement of people and tourism and a right range of things versus the real and actually what does happen when you think of that. I think there are, there are a couple of changes. Social media is making some, some of um, the abilities of governments and countries to restrict information. Uh, much harder. I'm not saying it's perfect and it's completely open because we know there's control controls in some countries, but it's certainly much harder to, to control. I actually think the WHO has worked hard to change reporting lines. So you know the massive debate about regional managers and information <coughs> lines. <coughs> they quite deliberately set up the um, new health emergency program arm of WHO. So there were different reporting lines. So it wasn't the same pressure, political pressure put on. Um, uh, leaders in, in the region, so that was a deliberate attempt to try and tackle some of that. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it was, it was acknowledgement of those reporting lines and how that information flows through. And again, uh, what we have seen is, is personal sharing of information from um, individuals, experts, and it's something we've tried to build again through the centre of building of uh, regional kind of personal links that people know and they swap information and share, and that can be the other way that information can come out. So I think some of those things are better, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't want to pretend that it's not a trade-off and it's not an active debate that happens in some countries for instance, some of these issues. And, and the other thing is we, we've obviously um, try as best as we can through our planning processes to anticipate you know what might be coming down at us and in particular our uh, Australian we have a, a um, Australian Health Management Plan for Pandemic Influenza and that um, it sort of looks at scenarios various different scenarios so you know you can have low pathogenesis and high transmissibility, or you can have low transmissibility and it could be highly pathogenic, it could be various things. And we don't know, we don't actually know the characterization of the virus until it gets here. So it's very important to be studying. I think they say the first 200 cases is, is a very important. So, so we've done a lot of scenario modeling and, um, and we, we're very, um, I guess we've got preparedness approaches in our systems about what to do, you know, um, in the event of a pandemic flu, um, in order to help us. Um, it, it's, it, is, it is incredibly difficult if you don't know what you're dealing with. We do have a couple of things that try to help us to be prepared. We've got a national medical stockpile, so in, in respect of the TAMI flu, um, so we do have a, a stockpile of tannic flu which can be distributed to states and territories if it's needed as well as being available, I would imagine, for purchase. It's currently on prescription, um, but there are powers <coughs> of emergency powers or powers uh, that there might be some uh, down scheduling um, of that so that it is more widely available in the event that it is needed. Um, and, uh, and, so, and also, um, basically, you know, just, um, uh, you know, making sure that we cohort um, uh, who needs to be vaccinated so that we're, we're trying to get the biggest bang for our buck up front. So, you know, health professionals, healthcare workers, etc., more vulnerable <coughs> populations are a really important parts of that. What we also do in Australia is, you know, mindful of the fact that a pandemic could be around the corner at any time, we do have a bit of a guess each year at what might be the, um, the, the, the influenza that could be um, around the corner of, of pandemic um, uh, potential and um, and we have a bulk vaccine that we keep in reserve and um, that's only ever going to be as good as your guess is <laughs> um, but that is an, an attempt by us to try to um, to scale up quickly in the event we need a mass vaccine program so I, I guess um, that that preparedness is something that we work on all the time. There's two more questions I think uh, well 
which I'll, I'll go to. I'll one, <coughs> one of the boys out here in one of the, <coughs> the, the plenty of volunteer boys. Uh, I must commend um, the JV results as well because they were bringing for Australia. Um, I, I was involved in that from the Department of Defence perspective. One of the things that we noted coming out was when we talk about preparedness is actually the product development capability of a manufacturing uh, country and our reliance on a single supplier at this point in time. Since the Ebola outbreak with MERS, SARS, H1N1, what are your opinions on the change in government uh, and their interest in investing in a national industrial and academic capability to support product development and advanced product development um, prior to and then bringing the right people together at that point in time to rapidly transition something um, for use? So what I guess I can say, you know, a very practical example <laughs> is that we're currently looking at this because what, what you're pointing to is um, is a, a bit of a vulnerability that we have in having one onshore supplier of um, seasonal influenza vaccine and potentially pandemic influenza vaccine, but at least we've got one onshore <laughs> provider. A lot of countries can't even say that. Um, so what we are looking at, and, and what we do is we pay an amount of money to secure us, so that's a company formerly by CSL, um, basically pay them capability funds to be there for us. So basically it's an insurance policy for the Australian nation to produce this influenza vaccine. Um, we don't know whether we're getting value for money. <coughs> Some people would say, who cares? The fact that you've got the capability is the most important thing. But we're also, uh, what we're dealing with is taxpayers' money. And we're also dealing with something, as you say, though, that it's a of national importance. So we've been doing a bit of a scoping study um, to determine what might be our options. So, you know, you could have an onshore supplier, you could not have an onshore supplier, what does that look like? Um, we all know that, that what happens, what might happen um, if there was a worldwide pandemic influenza outbreak and you've got your manufacturing confined to, you know, a few places throughout the world and countries can close their borders, what does that mean in terms of us getting vaccine away at the back of the queue? So we're really very conscious of all of that. So without giving too much away because we're in the middle of that scope, study um, we are right on to that issue and see it as really important and it's an opportunity for us to bring it before government and to get them to engage so talking about you know influencing decision makers um, because I find when you get in the room with decision makers and you put this proposition to them they get it but if it's not on the agenda if it's not in their face they're worrying about other things so I think what our job is to do is to make sure that we, we keep it up there as a prominent issue. And, and we're obviously a developed country with resources that we can do that. Mm. There is, I think, mean, better and works in progress, I would say, sort of um, global mechanisms trying to do a bit of prediction that where this may go to provide broader solutions mm. through stage two from memory of sort of trials of the 10, 3, I forget the exact number most likely pathogens mm -hmm. that will, will develop and get those to a stage where they can be picked up around, uh, around the world. So I think it's not just developed countries, there is a, some investment going on from a developing countries perspective as well. Okay, last question, I think. We'll check out of that. Thanks very much. Uh, Anthony Carrigan from Palladium. I think we've got a touch point with just about everyone on, on the panel. Um, great panel too, by the way. Um, very interesting. One well, look, following a little bit on, I think, from the defence, uh, the question there. Um, what do you see as the model for engagement with the private sector um, in terms of you know, preparedness and response? And uh, I guess, John, uh, potentially drawing on a bit of your experience from the US, um, we've talked a lot about the whole government stuff. Um, how do we get uh, how do we get the private sector involved in? Well, I. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that because the private sector, uh, one of the questions we asked at the beginning is in whose interest is it to prevent pandemics and epidemics? And one of the paradoxes is that the private sector has the most to gain from being, being prepared and, and for having um, all of the things we've talked about in place and the most to lose if they're not there. But in general, the perspective of the, that we've heard from the private sector is sort of, this is government's thing. So there, there is a, a global health security uh, private sector roundtable. 
and that's a good entity to to engage with to get to get the dots going. Um, I, I think also um, if you look at most uh, industrial associations, if you look at their websites, you think nothing has happened since 2009. There was all sorts of flurry of stuff, but if you look at it, uh, at, at, at different um, segments of aviation or other, they, they haven't caught up. So I, I think a lot of it is just consciousness uh, raising um, with, with chambers of commerce and other folks. That's, that's one piece of it for the broader private sector. Uh, Johnson & Johnson has been involved, um, and, and they've been good at that. But you may have other ideas specific to, to, to Australia and the industry. So, so, so the example I would probably give is um, Gavi, yeah, the, the Global Alliance of Vaccine. So it's some really fascinating and extremely beneficial market shaping work that they, they do, which is seeing uh, incredible reductions of uh, prices of vaccine, which doesn't deal with the necessary the um, kind of cases we're talking about, but overall does deal with levels of uh, resistance and, 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 and treatment. And there's some great work that's in the private sector's interest and then not-for-profit governments developing countries. That's actually been a really good um, collaboration and sharing. Some challenge in there, so still, I think the, the challenges we're looking forward to Gavi is it was a very early model, which is around a clear cohort of children to to um, to vaccinate. As countries are moving up, the um, their their income levels moving into lower middle income middle income. There's another a whole other set of questions now around what's the next stage of affordable pricing models for for countries that aren't lower income country. So I think some challenges there to work through, but there's some good foundations, if you like, that, that, that have already been, been started. Sure. Well, thank you very much for that. That's um, I've run out of a bit of time there. But I just want to thank um, Aspie and Lisa again for um, organising the event. And uh, if people could thank the panellists. <laughs>